Well, we're leaving China now and returning to India, where we began, but we're also going to be going to a very different tradition. We began with an orthodox tradition, the Bhagavad Gita and the Hindu tradition. We're going to now enter a heterodox tradition, the Buddhist tradition that arose in India as a reaction against Hinduism and then finally spread through almost the entire world. Early Buddhism spread first to places like Sri Lanka, then into China, finally into Tibet, and then off to East Asia, and then in our own time, we've seen the diffusion of Buddhism to the West. We're also going back a couple of centuries to about the fifth century BC. So we'll be talking about the teachings of the Buddha today, and we can think of this as roughly contemporaneous with the beginnings of the composition of the Mahabharata, with part of which is the Bhagavad Gita, roughly contemporary with the life of Confucius, roughly contemporary with the composition of the Tao Te Ching, so we're back into that same era, but as I said, moving to a very different tradition. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the life of the Buddha, about some of the basic ideas in Buddhism, and then about the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha taught in his very first discourse after gaining awakening, that is, after becoming a Buddha. Now, the person we call the Buddha, let's begin by, with that word Buddha for a moment. Some people think of that as a name, that he's called Buddha. That's not true. The word Buddha is an epithet. It literally means the guy who woke up. It comes from the Sanskrit word Bodhi, which means to wake up. Perfectly ordinary term. It's what you do when the alarm clock goes off. You Bodhi. And Buddha is just the past participle, the guy who woke up. He actually had a name. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and we can call him Sid for short if we want. Helps to kind of dispel some of the artificial reference. He lived in about the fifth century before the Common Era, as I said a few moments ago, and he was a prince in a small kingdom that is now in southern Nepal that was called Kapilavastu. And he was a member of a particular clan called the Shakya clan. Many people refer to him as Shakya Muni Buddha. Shakya is the clan of which he was a member. The word Muni means sage, so that epithet Shakya Muni means the sage of the Shakya clan. Anyway, enough for names. As we understand from his biography, um, he left home as a shramana fairly early. Um, and let's pause about, uh, on that idea for a moment. What is a shramana? In India at that time, and indeed in India today, a perfectly reasonable thing for a person to do late in life is to leave home and become a wandering mendicant and to try to really come to understand the nature of existence. You can think about it as kind of 1968 gone berserk. Um, this happens all the time in, in contemporary India, but was very common in classical India. It's something you do at the end of your life. The only thing that was unusual about Shakyamuni Buddha, about Sid, is that he left home very early when he was about 30 years old. He left the palace um, in which he was a prince, left his wife and his young son behind, and went out to try to solve a problem. And the problem that he went to try to solve was a very profound problem, the problem of why there is suffering in the world. And in fact, we, can, we, we will see in a little while, as we will see in a little while, the most profound insight of all, perhaps, in Buddhism is the idea that suffering is such a huge problem and that we can't understand the meaning of life without trying to solve that problem. As the story of his life has it, he spent about three years wandering around northern India and becoming the student or the disciple of a whole number of teachers who were teaching in various towns, teaching in the forest. And as the story has it, from each teacher he learned something, but he was a quick student, and within a very short time he exceeded what that teacher had to teach. And so he went from teacher to teacher, and he finally ran across these four other folks who were like him, young folks trying to find the meaning of life. They didn't start a hippie commune. Instead, what they did was they started practicing severe austerities, lots of self-mortification, starvation, and subjecting themselves to extremes of heat and cold, the kinds of things that they thought might finally lead to a spiritual breakthrough. But at some point, Sid realized that this doesn't lead to spiritual breakthrough at all. What it leads to is a loss of health, 
a lot of hunger, thirst, and discomfort, and that doesn't add up to brilliance. So he abandoned these um, companions and decided to try to find another route. He was near a small town um, called Bodhgaya, and he went and sat on the shore of a river, and a young woman from the town came and offered him some milk, some porridge, he had a good meal, and he thought about what to do next. And what he did was he sat down under a tree. You can see that tree now, you can go to that tree, the holiest pilgrimage spot for Buddhists. We call it the Bodhi tree, the tree of awakening. He sat down under that tree and he said to himself, I'm not going to arise until I have attained full awakening, until I am a Buddha. Note that before that, he's not a Buddha, he's just Siddhartha Gautama, the wandering mendicant, who's having a lot of trouble figuring out the meaning of life. So, he sits down at, under this tree in the evening, and he begins to meditate. And as the story goes, at dawn, he suddenly realized the fundamental nature of reality. He realized what the meaning of life was, he touched the ground, asked the earth to be his witness, and recognized that he was now fully awakened, that he was a Buddha. That's where Buddhism begins, with the awakening of Siddhartha Gautama under the Bodhi tree at Bodhgaya. Now, he realized that what he had understood was something very profound, something very difficult to communicate. And at first he was very reluctant to teach, and he spent a lot of time simply thinking about it, contemplating it, wandering around in, in Bodhgaya to try to figure out what to do. Now, legendarily, we're told that the god Prama came down and told him to go teach. We have no idea what actually led him to embark upon a teaching career. But at some point, he decided he was able to communicate his insight. And through the kind of network of wandering shramanas, through the shramana grapevine, he heard that his erstwhile colleagues in austerities were now hanging out and practicing their austerities in a little deer park outside of the ancient city of Varanasi in a place called Sarnath. And so he decided, maybe I'll find them and explain to them the fundamentals of what I've understood. And he did. He walked to Sarnath, it's a couple of hundred miles, found his erstwhile companions. Um, at first they said, ah, oh, let's not pay any attention to Sid, the guy's looking too fat, looking too healthy, he's obviously given up on serious spiritual work. Then they kind of noticed that he was glowing, he looked a little bit too happy, and they listened to him. He said, I have to tell you something, I'm now a Buddha, I've been awakened. And at Sarnath, he gave them his first public teaching, the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, we call it the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, that is the discourse that turned the wheel of Dharma. And in that first teaching, he enunciated all of the fundamental principles of Buddhism. For the next 45 years, he wandered all over North India, gathering more and more and more students, hundreds, perhaps thousands of students. Um, and the, he ordained them as monks, and they became the beginning of the Buddhist Sangha, the, or, the order of Buddhist monks, and are those who have since transmitted Buddhism for all of the centuries since. So that's a brief summary of the life of the Buddha and where this all came from. But now, I'd like to spend some time with you talking about the fundamental principles of Buddhism that the Buddha announced in that Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, in that discourse of the turning of the wheel given in Sarnath. A spot now, by the way, marked by a beautiful old stupa. You can visit that spot, a very beautiful place to go. So we're going to talk about three fundamental ideas that animate all of Buddhist philosophy. I should emphasize, Buddhism has become an enormously diverse family of traditions. There are differences between Buddhism as it's understood in Sri Lanka, from Buddhism as it's understood in Tibet, or Japan, or for that matter, parts of the United States. But I'm going to talk now about ideas that are common to all Buddhist traditions. The first will be the idea of impermanence, and we'll understand that in a very deep way, selflessness, and interdependence or dependent origination. These are three ideas that are closely tied with one another, but for analytic purposes, we're going to treat them one at a time. The Buddha recognized that all phenomena around us, all phenomena, are impermanent. We've encountered that idea before, but the Buddha pushed it a little bit more deeply than some of the people we've encountered before. 
he divided impermanence into two different uh, levels. There's gross impermanence, which is the impermanence we observe around ourselves all the time. Once I was a young boy, then I was a young man, now you see I'm kind of an old guy, soon I'm going to be dead. Um, we see a tree that is a sapling, and finally it's a big tree, nations come and go, the kind of impermanence that we see all the time. Things arise, they endure for a while, and they pass away. But the Buddha emphasized that this um, gross impermanence is undergirded by what he called a subtle impermanence. That it's not that things change slowly over time, as I've been saying, but everything is changing constantly, moment to moment. Nothing remains in its current state for more than an instant. As I speak to you, atoms of my body are evaporating or sublimating into the air. Bits of my hair are falling. Other parts of my body are growing and developing. Cells are being replaced. From one moment to another, I am a different thing. And that's true of everything in the universe, constantly changing in levels that we can't perceive, but that have to be there if gross impermanence is to be a reality. And for that reason, the Buddha said, we need to think about entities around us, not as stable things, because for a thing to be the same thing from moment to moment would be for it to share all of its properties. That's what identity means. Identity is like the identity between the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. They have exactly the same properties. They are one and the same thing. But the President, the President of the United States now and the President of the United States now, a few seconds later, are different from one another. The latter is a few seconds older than the former, so they're not the same thing. The Buddha therefore thought that we should think about ourselves and everything around us as continua of causal processes, as sequences of momentary events, not as single solid things that persist through time. That's the Buddhist idea of impermanence. There are no things. There are only continua of constantly changing phenomena, and we conceptually impute entityhood to them. But the entityhood is something that we impose, not something that's there in nature. And in particular, when we think about ourselves as continuing and living for years and years and years, that's an imputation based upon a continuum of constantly changing phenomena. The second major idea is this idea of selflessness, the idea that there's no core, no basic entity to things. And the Buddha connected this deeply to impermanence, but distinguished between two different kinds of selflessness to which we need to attend, the selflessness of the person, that is my own selflessness, and the selflessness of phenomena. Because things are constantly changing, there's no component, no identity that they retain over time. There's no core or essence that makes a thing the thing that it is. But similarly for ourselves, we might think, well, there's me, I, the subject that's got a body, that's got a mind, that's got thoughts, that's got experience. The Buddha argued that that's an illusion. If we look inside, we find the thoughts, we find the experiences, we find the perceptions, we find the emotional states, we find the parts of our body. But if we look for the I, the core thing that possesses all of those, we find absolutely nothing at all. You can try this at home. Remove all of your thoughts, remove your body, remove your memories, remove your personality, remove your perceptions, and ask what's left. The Buddha's insight was nothing is left. Persons are fundamentally selfless just constantly changing continua, and that's because of their impermanence. Closely connected to all of these is the idea that everything in the universe, including ourselves and every state of ourselves, is interdependent. And the Buddha distinguished three kinds of interdependence. There's causal interdependence. Everything that occurs depends upon causes and conditions. Nothing just happens, and everything that occurs has effects. So everything is linked in a complex cause and effect nexus. But moreover, things are interdependent in a myriological sense. That is, holes are dependent on their parts, parts are dependent on their holes. Consider your automobile, for instance. Your automobile exists only in dependence on the engine, the transmission, the wheels, the doors, the gear shift, and so forth. Without all of those parts, no hole. But at the same time, each of those parts depends for its identity on the whole. 
if you take the brakes out of the car, they're no longer brakes. They're pieces of metal and mechanism that could break a car if they were in there, but need to be in a car to actually be brakes. Take the gear shift out and you just have a stick. You don't have a gear shift anymore. So things depend for their identity and their existence on the holes of which they're parts, and the holes depend upon the parts, and this interdependence is, pervades all of existence. Most subtly, most subtly of all, the Buddha argued that everything depends for its identity on what he called conceptual imputation. That is because as we analyze the world, we find just a huge continuum of momentary events that are causally connected to one another, that are totally impermanent, that are selfless, that have no identity of their own. The identity that we find, the identity of your car, the identity of your body, my identity, the identity of the United States, the identity of a piece of paper as a dollar bill, all arise from our own conceptual categories, our own conceptual imputation, our decision to regard this particular continuum or this particular slice of reality as a thing and to give it a name. The echoes of Taoism, by the way, should be really interesting here. And of course, interdependence is deeply connected to impermanence and deeply connected to selflessness. Things are, are impermanent because they're interdependent. Things are selfless because they don't have any essence of their own but depend always upon other things and their place in this vast network. Those are the fundamental ideas that animate Buddhism. And when we look at the Four Noble Truths in a moment, and then later, when we look at the writings of Buddhist ethicists like Shantideva and finally the Dalai Lama, you will see all of these ideas of impermanence, selflessness, and interdependence animating all of these ideas. But at Sarnath, what the Buddha really enunciated that makes the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, this discourse on the turning of the wheel of the law, so famous and so important, are what are usually called the Four Noble Truths. Now, I hate that name, because truths are neither noble nor ignoble. They're just truths. Really, when we look at that phrase, Arya Satcha in Sanskrit, noble truth, what it really means is the four truths that someone should bear in mind if he or she would be noble, would lead a noble life. So if you want to lead a noble life, the idea is these are the truths that you ought to bear in mind. The truths themselves aren't noble. These are the fundamental insights um, at which the Buddha arrived under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya. So now what I'd like to do with, do with you is to work through these four truths for those who would be noble, which form the foundation of Buddhism for any Buddhist in any tradition. This is the foundation of the whole thing, even as these three ideas of impermanence, selflessness, and interdependence are the three philosophical ideas that animate the view. Now, what's the first truth? The first truth, we have to say with a great sweep of the hand, all this is suffering. What does this mean? The this means everything. It means me, it means you, it means the world, it means life. Everything is permeated and pervaded by suffering. That was the Buddha's first profound insight. Remember the problem that Buddhism is all about. Buddhism is about solving a problem. It's about solving the problem of suffering. And the Buddha's first insight was that to solve this problem, you need to identify it. And suffering isn't something local or isolated or temporary or here and there but not here. But suffering is all pervasive. And that's the beginning of the solution. What does he mean by that, though? What does he mean? Well, he means that each thing that we encounter is either itself a source of suffering, a cause of suffering, or something experiencing suffering. We suffer when we're separated from what we'd like. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, says Janis Joplin. That's a form of suffering. We're suffering when we're in the presence of something that we don't like. I've got the blues again. We suffer from the fact that we grow old, that we suffer from illness, and that we suffer from death. And that's true of all of us. And everything we look at is a potential source of suffering in this sense. Now, the Buddha distinguished three kinds of suffering. One of them, the most obvious one, he called the suffering of suffering. That is ordinary pain, headaches, illness, 
unpleasantness, people we don't like, and so forth. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune um, that we encounter all the time. The second kind of suffering he distinguished was what he called the suffering of change. And that has two aspects. First aspect is the fact that change itself is a source of suffering. We grow old. We try to, we, we don't like that. You can tell that we don't like that because we go out and buy oil of Olay or something like that. Um, we then become less capable. We become more disabled and we die. That's part of the suffering of change. But there's another part of the suffering of change. The other part is that things that we enjoy suddenly become unpleasant if they hang around too long. You're probably loving this lecture. At least I hope you are. But you know it's only going to last a half hour. If we were here for three, four, five, six hours with me droning on and on and on like this, after a while you'd say, enough, enough, somebody turn the television off, somebody turn the tape player off. That's the suffering of change, that even what's pleasant becomes unpleasant after a while. The third and most con complicated and difficult to understand, but the most important because it underlies the first two, is what the Buddha called the suffering of pervasive conditioning. The only way I know to really explain this is through an analogy. Suppose I'm a travel agent, and you come to me to plan a vacation. And I say to you, I've got just the place for you. It's this island. It's somewhere in the Pacific. Most people who go there have a really good time. The food's good. The beaches are nice. Lots of sunshine. But a few people from time to time get food poisoning and die. A couple have been eaten by sharks. Sometimes there's a typhoon. But sometimes everything's really nice. Uh, do you want to go? And you'd probably look at me like I was nuts. Who would want to go to some place where you're at the mercy of the weather, of other people's cooking, at fish in the sea, and you never know exactly what's going to happen to you? What a terrible place that would be. You would have no control over your life. The Buddha's insight is that's the ticket you bought when you were born. You live in a world where most of what happens to you is completely out of your control. You don't control the stock market. You don't control what's going on in Europe. You don't control what the weather is. You don't control what illnesses might befall you or illnesses might befall your friends. You live in a world of uncertainty, and the uncertainty is because everything depends upon a vast network of causes and conditions that are out of your control. And that background anxiety that that causes is the pervasive suffering that is what gives rise to the suffering of change, because change occurs as a result of causes and conditions, and what conditions the suffering of suffering. That deep analysis of the nature of suffering is what makes the Buddha's insight that all this is suffering more than just a banality. Buddhist ethics is about solving a problem. Diagnosis is the first part of the problem. The diagnosis continues with the second truth. The second truth is that there's a cause of suffering. Bumper stickers to the contrary notwithstanding, suffering doesn't just happen. It, like everything else, happens for a reason. And the Buddha's insight was that suffering is caused by attraction and aversion. It's caused by wanting something but not being able to get it, or getting something and not wanting it. Those are the two principal causes of suffering. I want it but can't have it. I've got it, and gosh, I wish somebody else had it. That's the, those are the, primal, the, the first two causes. But those two causes, in, in turn, are caused by something else. And this is part of the deep insight of the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. What is that something else? That something else is what the Buddha called primal ignorance, or basic confusion. And that confusion is not recognizing that things are impermanent. <clears throat> not recognizing that things are selfless not recognizing that things are interdependent. Because the Buddha recognized that most of us in most of our lives treat ourselves and those things around us as though they are enduring, relatively stable, permanent things. We treat them as though they have natures that make them the things that they are, independent of our imputation and desires, independent of their parts, independent of their causes and conditions. That I am a self-made man with plans for the future. I am an independent entity. You can't tell me what to do or make me do what I don't want to do. And we fail to understand interdependence. That confusion that the Buddha is talking about, that ignorance, isn't a mere lack of understanding. It's a positive phenomena. It's a reflex cognitive habit, a superimposition of permanence, entityhood, and independence on that which is impermanent, selfless, and interdependent. 
by superimposing those, we treat what is attractive as a lot more important than it is. We treat what's aversive as a lot worse than it is. And we treat them as having natures that make them desirable or undesirable as they are in themselves. And we treat change as something to be dreaded, something to hate, something to be resisted, rather than a natural part of our lives. And so that superimposition is what causes attraction and, and aversion. And the attraction and the aversion give rise to the sufferings of pervasive conditioning, change, and the suffering of suffering. That's the diagnosis of the cause of suffering. Well, it's one thing to say that suffering has a cause, but what do you do about that? The great thing to know, the Buddha said, about the cause of suffering is that once you know that it has a cause, you know that it, there is a release from suffering. You know that because to release yourself from something that's caused, all you got to do is remove the cause. So if you're sick because there's bacteria in you, get rid of the bacteria, you get rid of the illness. So the Buddha's insight was that because the fundamental root cause of suffering is this kind of primal ignorance or instinctive confusion, if we eliminate that, suffering can cease. And so the idea in Buddhist practice is to reduce attraction, to reduce aversion, and to do that by reducing this primal confusion, that is, by coming to understand the fundamental nature of reality. Notice here we have to distinguish between pain and suffering. It's one thing for me to have a headache. It's another thing for that headache to be a source of my suffering. It's one thing for me not to have a Mercedes Benz. It's another thing for my lack of Mercedes Benz hood to be a source of suffering. The Buddha said we can't get rid of pain. We can't get rid of change. We can't get rid of old age, illness, and death. But we can get rid of the suffering that they attend. And we achieve that by removing this kind of primal confusion about those things and about ourselves. So here we're operating with a kind of medical model, and the Buddha is often called the great physician. We have a diagnosis, there's suffering, and it has these three forms. We have an etiology, that is primal confusion leading to attraction and ignorance. We have a cure, now that we know it is possible, that is the removal of that confusion with the consequent removal of the attraction and aversion. But now we need a prescription. And the prescription is the fourth truth, the so-called eightfold path for those who would be noble. The eightfold path sets out the domain of morality for Buddhism. And it sets it out not by a set of commandments, not by identifying a set of virtues, not even by identifying a set of goods, but by pointing out a set of domains. In Sanskrit, we'd call them vastus, domains of concern, suggesting that if we pay attention to those domains and live appropriately in those domains, we can eliminate primal ignorance, eliminate attraction, eliminate aversion, and hence eliminate suffering. So morality here is a kind of identification of domains of life in which we need to solve problems. There are three principal domains in this story. The first is the domain of action. The limbs of the Eightfold Path there are right action. Do things that conduce to happiness and not to suffering, to oneself and for others. Right livelihood. How we make our living makes a difference. If you make your living as a hitman, then elimination of suffering is pretty hard. If you make your living doing something that's charitable and beneficial, that organizes your life in fundamental ways that will make your life happier. There's a Buddhist insight here that the way we make our livings organizes our lives in fundamental ways. Right propriety. Carry yourself right. Be honest, be decent, um, behave in a polite way and a pleasant way with people because that makes you more effective and you can only work to eliminate suffering, that of yourself or others, if you're effective. And if you don't maintain propriety, nobody's going to listen to you. Right speech. Tell the truth. Don't tell lies. Say what's useful. Don't talk about what's useless. That's the domain of action. There's also a domain of thought. In the domain of thought, the Buddha distinguished right view. You really do need to understand interdependence, impermanence, and selflessness if you want to eliminate suffering. Right meditation. That is, it's not enough to think about this theoretically, because what we're trying to uproot is an instinctive way of seeing reality, not just a theory about it. And that requires the view to settle in, to become part of how we take up with the world. 
And the reason that meditation is so important in Buddhism is that that's the vehicle for allowing the view to settle in and to become part of how we behave instinctively and naturally. Right effort. The Buddha emphasized that none of this is easy. You've really got to work at it. You've really got to pay attention. You've really got to do it. And finally, right mindfulness. Because it's actually easy, as a teacher of mine once said, to practice the first seven of these at any moment. Do it right now. Maintain the right view. Meditate for a second. Make some effort right now. Don't do anything bad, and so forth. And as he pointed out, all you need to do is to do that for one second, then another second, then another second, then another second, and you can follow those seven parts of the Eightfold Path for your entire life. But how do you make sure that you're doing it from moment to moment? That's where mindfulness comes in, paying attention to what you're doing moment to moment. And this notion of mindfulness is an absolute foundation of all of Buddhist practice. That's one of the deep insights that we're going to take away from this, that the fundamental idea, the fundamental practice in making one's life meaningful is to be mindful of it moment to moment. All of this forces us to focus on the impermanence of things, to focus on the fact that things are interdependent, to focus on the fact that any identity things have is our projection. And that reduces our attachment to things. We know they just come and go. It reduces our aversion to things. We know that they just come and go. And so it reduces our suffering. In the next few lectures, we're going to examine the way that these fundamental ideas of Buddhism develop and develop into an account of precisely how we should lead our lives and how our lives can become meaningful in the context of the moral theory of the great Buddhist scholar Shantideva in his wonderful text, How to Lead an Awakened Life. That will provide us with an analysis of the Mahayana view, the great vehicle view of Buddhism, which will in turn enable us to return to China and enter the Zen tradition, where we will interfuse these Buddhist ideas with Taoist ideas. Please join me for that lecture.